And now, Chapter 13, Lord Krishna and Balaram meet the inhabitants of Vrindavan. Once upon a time, while Lord Krishna and Balaram were living peacefully in their great city of Dvorka, there was the rare occasion of a full solar eclipse, such as takes place at the end of every kalpa or day of Brahma. At the end of every kalpa, the sun is covered by a great cloud, and incessant rain covers the lower planetary systems up to Svargalok. By astronomical calculation, people were informed about this great eclipse prior to its taking place, and therefore everyone, both men and women, decided to assemble at the holy place in Kurukshetra known as Samanta Panchak. The Samanta Panchak pilgrimage site is celebrated because Lord Parasuram performed great sacrifices there after having killed all the Kshatriyas in the world 21 times. Lord Parasuram killed all the Kshatriyas and their accumulated blood flowed like a stream. Lord Parasuram dug five big lakes at Samanta Panchak and filled them with this blood. Lord Parasuram is Vishnu Tattva. As stated in the Ishopanishad, Vishnu Tattva cannot be contaminated by any sinful activity. Yet although Lord Parasuram is fully powerful and uncontaminated, in order to exhibit ideal character, he performed great sacrifices at Samanta Panchak to atone for his so-called sinful killing of the Kshatriyas. By his example, Lord Parashuram established that the killing art, although sometimes necessary, is not good. Lord Parashuram considered himself culpable for the sinful killing of the Kshatriyas. Therefore, how much more are we culpable for such abominable, unsanctioned acts? Thus, killing of living entities is prohibited from time immemorial all over the world. Taking advantage of the occasion of the solar eclipse, all important persons visited the holy place of pilgrimage. Some of the important personalities are mentioned as follows. Among the elderly persons were Akrura, Vasudev, and Ugrasen. And among the younger generation were Gad, Pradyumna, Samba, and many other members of the Yadu dynasty who had come there with a view to atone for sinful activities accrued in the course of discharging their respective duties. Because almost all of the members of the Yadu dynasty went to Kurukshetra, some important personalities like Aniruddha, the son of Pradyumna, and Kritavarma, the commander-in-chief of the Yadu dynasty, along with Suchandra, Shuk, and Sharan, remained in Dvorka to protect the city. All the members of the Yadu dynasty were naturally very beautiful. Yet on this occasion, when they appeared duly decorated with gold necklaces and flower garlands, dressed in valuable clothing and properly armed with their respective weapons, their natural beauty and personalities were a hundred times enhanced. The members of the Yadu dynasty came to Kurukshetra in their gorgeously decorated chariots resembling the airplanes of the demigods and pulled by big horses that moved like the waves of the ocean. Some of them rode on sturdy, stalwart elephants that moved like the clouds in the sky. 
Their wives were carried on beautiful palanquins by beautiful men whose features resembled those of the Vidyadharas. The entire assembly looked as beautiful as an assembly of the demigods of heaven. After arriving in Kurukshetra, the members of the Yadu dynasty took their bath ceremoniously with self-control as enjoined in the Shastras, and they observed fasting for the whole period of the eclipse in order to nullify the reactions of their sinful activities. Since it is a Vedic custom to give in charity as much as possible during the hours of the eclipse, the members of the Yadu dynasty distributed many hundreds of cows in charity to the Brahmins. All those cows were fully decorated with nice dress and ornaments. The special feature of these cows was that they had golden ankle bells and flower garlands on their necks. After the eclipse, all the members of the Yadu dynasty again took their baths in the lakes created by Lord Padashuram. Then they sumptuously fed the Brahmins with first-class cooked food, all prepared in butter. According to the Vedic system, there are two classes of food. One is called raw food and the other is called cooked food. Raw food does not include raw vegetables and raw grains, but food boiled in water, whereas cooked food is made in ghee, chapatis, dal, rice, and ordinary vegetables are called raw foods, as are fruits and salads. But puris, kachoris, samosas, sweet balls, and so on are called cooked foods. All the Brahmins invited on that occasion by the members of the Yadu dynasty were fed sumptuously with cooked food. The ceremonial functions performed by the members of the Yadu dynasty externally resembled the ritualistic performances performed by the Karmis. When a Karmi performs some ritualistic ceremony, his ambition is sense gratification. Good position, good wife, good house, good children, or good wealth. But the ambition of the members of the Yadu dynasty was different. Their ambition was to offer perpetual faith and devotion to Krishna. All the members of the Yadu dynasty were great devotees. As such, after many births of accumulated pious activities, they were given the chance to associate with Lord Krishna. In going to take their baths in the place of pilgrimage at Kurukshetra, in observing the regulative principles during the solar eclipse, or in feeding the Brahmins, in all their activities, they simply thought of devotion to Krishna. Their ideal worshipable Lord was Krishna and no one else. After the Brahmins are fed, it is the custom for the host, with their permission, to accept prasadam. Thus, with the permission of the Brahmins, all the members of the Yadu dynasty took lunch. Then they selected resting places underneath big shadowy trees, and when they had taken sufficient rest, they prepared to receive visitors, among whom were relatives and friends, as well as many subordinate kings and rulers. There were rulers of the Matsya province, Ushinara province, Koshal province, Vidarbha province, Kuru province, Srinjaya province, Kamboj province, Kekaya province, Madras province, Kunti province, Anarta province, and Keral province, and many other countries and provinces. Some of the rulers belonged to opposing parties, and some were friends, but above all, the visitors from Vrindavan were most prominent. The residents of Vrindavan, headed by Nanda Maharaj, had been living in great anxiety because of separation from Krishna and Balaram. Taking advantage of the solar eclipse, they all came to see their life and soul, Krishna and Balaram.
The inhabitants of Vrindavan were well-wishers and intimate friends of the Yadu dynasty. This meeting of the two parties after long separation was a very touching incident. Both the Yadus and the residents of Vrindavan felt such great pleasure in meeting and talking together that it was a unique scene. Meeting after long separation, they were all jubilant. Their hearts throbbed and their faces appeared like freshly bloomed lotus flowers. Drops of tears fell from their eyes. The hair on their bodies stood on end, and because of their extreme ecstasy, they were temporarily speechless. In other words, they began to dive in the ocean of happiness. While the men were meeting in that way, the women also met one another in the same manner. They embraced one another in great friendship, smiling very mildly, and looked at one another with much affection. When they were embracing one another in their arms, the saffron and kunkum spread on their breasts was exchanged from one person to another, and they all felt heavenly ecstasy. Due to such heart-to-heart -heart embracing, torrents of tears glided down their cheeks. The juniors were offering obeisances to the elders, and the elders were offering their blessings to the juniors. They thus welcomed one another and asked after one another's welfare. Ultimately, however, all their talk was only of Krishna. All the neighbors and relatives were connected with Lord Krishna's pastimes in this world, and as such, Krishna was the center of all their activities. Whatever activities they performed, social, political, religious, or conventional, were transcendental. The real elevation of human life rests on knowledge and renunciation. As stated in the Srimad Bhagavatam in the first canto, devotional service rendered to Krishna automatically produces perfect knowledge and renunciation. The family members of the Yadu dynasty and the cowherd men of Vrindavan had their minds fixed on Krishna. That is the symptom of all knowledge and because their minds were always engaged in Krishna, they were automatically freed from all material activities. This stage of life is called Yukta Vairagya, as enunciated by Srila Rupa Goswami. Knowledge and renunciation, therefore, do not mean dry speculation and renunciation of activities. Rather, one must start speaking and acting only in relationship with Krishna. In this meeting at Kurukshetra, Kunti Devi and Vasudev, who were sister and brother, met after a long separation along with their respective sons and daughters-in-law, wives, children, and other family members. By talking among themselves, they soon forgot all their past miseries. Kunti Devi especially addressed her brother Vasudev as follows. My dear brother, I am, I am very unfortunate because not one of my desires has ever been fulfilled. Otherwise, how could it happen that although I have such a saintly brother as you, perfect in all respects, you did not inquire for me as to how I was passing my days in a distressed condition of life? It appears that Kunti Devi was remembering the miserable days when she had been banished with her sons to the mischievous plans of Dhritarashtra and Duryodhan. She continued, My dear brother, I can understand that when providence goes against someone, even one's nearest relatives also forget him. In such a condition, even one's father, one's mother, or one's own children will forget him. Therefore, my dear brother, I do not accuse you. Vasudev replied to his sister, My dear sister, do not be sorry and do not blame me in that way. We should always remember that we are all only toys in the hands of providence. 
Everyone is under the control of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. It is under His control only that all kinds of fruitive actions and their reactions take place. My dear sister, you know that we were very much harassed by King Kamsa, and by his persecutions we were scattered here and there. We were always full of anxieties. Only in the last few days have we returned to our own places by the grace of God. After this conversation, Vasudev and Ugrasen received the kings who came to see them, and they sufficiently welcomed them all. Seeing Lord Krishna present on the spot, all the visitors felt transcendental pleasure and became very peaceful. Some of the prominent visitors were as follows. Bhishma Dev, Dronacharya, Dhritarashtra, Duryodhan, and Gandhari along with her sons, King Yudhishthir along with his wife, and the Pandavas along with Kunti, Srinjaya, Vidura, Kripacharya, Kunti Bhoj, Virat, King Nagnajit, Purujit, Drupad, Salya, Drishtaketu, the king of Kashi, Damagosh, Vishalaksha, the king of Mithila, the king of Madras, formerly known as Madra, the king of Kekaya, Yudamanyu, Shusharma, Bahilik, along with his sons, and many other rulers subordinate to King Yudhishthir. When they saw Lord Krishna with his thousands of queens, they were fully satisfied at the sight of such beauty and transcendental opulence. All who were there personally visited Lord Balaram and Krishna, and being properly welcomed by the Lord, they began to glorify the members of the Yadu dynasty, especially Krishna and Balaram. Because Ugrasen was the king of the Bojas, he was considered the chief Yadu, and therefore the visitors specifically addressed him. Your Majesty Ugrasen, King of the Bojas. Factually, the Yadus are the only persons within this world who are perfect in all respects. All glories unto you, all glories unto you. The specific condition of your perfection is that you always see Lord Krishna, who is sought by many mystic yogis undergoing severe austerities and penances for great numbers of years. All of you are in direct touch with Lord Krishna at every moment. All the Vedic hymns glorify the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Krishna. The Ganges water is considered sanctified because of its being the water used to wash the lotus feet of Lord Krishna. The Vedic literatures are nothing but the injunctions of Lord Krishna. The purpose of the study of all the Vedas is to know Krishna. Therefore, the words of Krishna and the message of his pastimes are always purifying. By the influence of time and circumstances, all the opulences of this world were almost completely wiped out. But since Krishna has appeared on this planet, all auspicious features have again appeared due to the touch of His lotus feet. Because of His presence, all our ambitions and desires are gradually being fulfilled. Your Majesty, King of the Bojas, you are related with the Yadu dynasty by matrimonial relationship and by blood relationship also. As a result, you are constantly in touch with Lord Krishna and you have no difficulty in seeing Him at any time. Lord Krishna moves with you, talks with you, sits with you, rests with you, and dines with you. The Yadus appear to be always engaged in worldly affairs, which are considered to lead to the royal road to hell. But due to the presence of Lord Krishna, the original personality of Godhead in the Vishnu category, who is omniscient, omnipresent, and omnipotent, all of you are factually relieved from all material contamination 
and are situated in the transcendental position of liberation and Brahman existence. When they had heard that Krishna would be present in Kurukshetra because of the solar eclipse, the residents of Vrindavan, headed by Maharaj Nanda, had also decided to go there, and therefore all the members of the Yadu dynasty were attending. King Nanda, accompanied by his cowherd men, had loaded all their necessary paraphernalia on bullock carts, and all of the Vrindavan residents had come to Kurukshetra to see their beloved sons, Lord Balaram and Lord Krishna. When the cowherd men of Vrindavan arrived in Kurukshetra, all the members of the Yadu dynasty were most pleased. As soon as they saw the residents of Vrindavan, they stood up to welcome them and appeared to have regained their life. Both had been very eager to meet, and when they actually came forward and met, they embraced one another to their heart's satisfaction and remained in embrace for a considerable time. As soon as Vasudev saw Nanda Maharaj, he jumped and ran over to him and embraced him very affectionately. Vasudev began to narrate his past history, how he had been imprisoned by King Kamsa, how his babies had been killed, how immediately after Krishna's birth he had carried Krishna to the place of Nanda Maharaj, and how Krishna and Balaram had been raised by Nanda Maharaj and his queen Yashoda as their own children. Similarly, Lord Balaram and Krishna also embraced King Nanda and Mother Yashoda, and then offered their respect unto their lotus feet by bowing down. Because of their feeling affection for Nanda and Yashoda, both Lord Krishna and Balaram became choked up, and for a few seconds they could not speak. The most fortunate King Nanda and Mother Yashoda placed their sons on their laps and began to embrace them to their full satisfaction. Because of separation from Krishna and Balaram, both King Nanda and Yashoda had been merged in great distress for a very long time. Now after meeting them and embracing them, all their sufferings were mitigated. After this, Krishna's mother, Devaki, and Balaram's mother, Rohini, both embraced Mother Yashoda. They said, Dear Queen Yashoda Devi, both you and Nanda Maharaj have been great friends to us, and when we remember you, we are immediately overwhelmed by the thought of your friendly activities. We are so indebted to you that even if we were to return your benediction by giving you the opulence of the King of Heaven, it would not be enough to repay you for your friendly behavior. We shall never forget your kindly behavior toward us. When both Krishna and Balaram were born, before they even saw their real father and mother, they were entrusted to your care, and you raised them as your own children, fostering them as birds take care of their offspring in the nest. You have nicely fed, nourished, and loved them and have performed many auspicious religious ceremonies for their benefit. Actually, they are not our sons. They belong to you. Nanda Maharaj and you are the real father and mother of Krishna and Balaram. As long as they were under your care, they had not even a pinch of difficulty. Under your protection, they were completely out of the way of all kinds of fear. The most affectionate care which you have taken for them is completely befitting your elevated position. The most noble personalities do not discriminate between their own sons and the sons of others, and there cannot be any personalities more noble than Nanda Maharaj and you.
As far as the gopis of Vrindavan were concerned, from the very beginning of their lives, they did not know anything beyond Krishna. Krishna and Balaram were their life and soul. The gopis were so attached to Krishna that they could not even tolerate not seeing him momentarily when their eyelids blinked and impeded their vision. They condemned Brahma, the creator of the body, because he foolishly made eyelids which blinked and checked their seeing Krishna. Because they had been separated from Krishna for so many years, the gopis, having come along with Nanda Maharaj and Mother Yashoda, felt intense ecstasy in seeing Krishna. No one can even imagine how eager the gopis were to see Krishna again. As soon as Krishna became visible to them, they took him inside their hearts through their eyes and embraced him to their full satisfaction. Even though they were embracing Krishna only mentally, they became so ecstatic and overwhelmed with joy that for the time being they completely forgot themselves. The ecstatic trance they achieved simply by mentally embracing Krishna is impossible to achieve even for great yogis constantly engaged in meditation on the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Krishna could understand that the gopis were wrapped in ecstasy by embracing Him in their minds, and therefore, since He is present in everyone's heart, He reciprocated the embracing from within. Krishna was sitting with Mother Yashoda and his other mothers, Devaki and Rohini. But when the mothers engaged in talking, he took the opportunity and went to a secluded place to meet the gopis. As soon as he approached the gopis, the Lord began to smile, and after embracing them and inquiring about their welfare, he began to encourage them, saying, My dear friends, you know that both Lord Balaram and I left Vrindavan just to please our relatives and family members. Thus we were long engaged in fighting with our enemies and were obliged to forget you who were so much attached to me in love and affection. I can understand that I have been ungrateful to you, but still I know that you are faithful to me. May I inquire if you have been thinking of us, although we had to leave you behind. My dear gopis, do you now dislike remembering me, considering me to have been ungrateful to you? Do you take my misbehavior with you very seriously? After all, you should know that it was not my intention to leave you. Our separation was ordained by Providence, who after all is the supreme controller and does as he desires. He causes the intermingling of different persons and again disperses them as he desires. Sometimes we see that due to the presence of clouds and strong wind, atomic particles of dust and broken pieces of cotton are mingled together, and after the strong wind subsides, all the particles of dust and cotton are again separated, scattered in different places. Similarly, the Supreme Lord is the Creator of everything. The objects we see are different manifestations of His energy. By His supreme will, we are sometimes united and sometimes separated. We can therefore conclude that ultimately we are absolutely dependent on His will.
Fortunately, you have developed loving affection for me, which is the only way to achieve the transcendental position of association with me. Any living entity who develops such unalloyed devotional affection for me certainly at the end goes back home, back to Godhead. In other words, unalloyed devotional service and affection for me are the cause of supreme liberation. My dear Gopi friends, you may know from me that it is my energies only which are acting everywhere. Take for example an earthen pot. It is nothing but a combination of earth, water, air, fire, and sky. It is always of the same physical composites, whether in its beginning, during its existence, or after its annihilation. When it is created, the earthen pot is made of earth, water, fire, air, and sky. While it remains, it is the same composition, and when it is broken and annihilated, its different ingredients are conserved in different parts of the material energy. Similarly, at the creation of this cosmic manifestation, during its maintenance and after its dissolution, everything is but a different manifestation of my energy. And because the energy is not separate from me, it is to be concluded that I am existing in everything. In the same way, the body of a living being is nothing but a composition of the five elements, and the living entity embodied in the material condition is also part and parcel of me. The living entity is imprisoned in the material condition on account of his false conception of himself as the supreme enjoyer. This false ego of the living entity is the cause of his imprisonment in material existence. As the supreme absolute truth, I am transcendental to the living entity as well as to his material embodiment. The two energies, material and spiritual, both act under my supreme control. My dear gopis, I request that instead of being afflicted, you try to accept everything with a philosophical attitude. Then you will understand that you are always with me and that there is no cause of lamentation in our being separated from one another. This important instruction by Lord Krishna to the gopis can be utilized by all devotees engaged in Krishna consciousness. The whole philosophy is considered on the basis of inconceivable simultaneous oneness and difference. In Bhagavad Gita, the Lord says that He is present everywhere in His impersonal feature. Everything exists in Him, but still He is not personally present everywhere. The cosmic manifestation is nothing but a display of Krishna's energy, and because the energy is not different from the energetic, nothing is different from Krishna. When this absolute consciousness, Krishna consciousness, is absent, we are separated from Krishna. But fortunately, if this Krishna consciousness is present, then we are not separated from Krishna. The process of devotional service is the revival of Krishna consciousness. And if the devotee is fortunate enough to understand that the material energy is not separate from Krishna, then he can utilize the material energy and its products in the service of the Lord. But in the absence of Krishna consciousness, the forgetful living entity, although part and parcel of Krishna, falsely puts himself in the position of enjoyer of the material world, and, being thus implicated in material entanglement, is forced by the material energy to continue his material existence. This is also confirmed in the Bhagavad Gita. Although a living entity is forced to act by the material energy, he falsely thinks that he is the all in all and the supreme enjoyer.
If the devotee knows perfectly that the Archa Vigraha, or deity form of Lord Krishna in the temple, is exactly the same Satchitananda Vigraha as Krishna himself, then his service to the temple deity becomes direct service to the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Similarly, the temple itself, the temple paraphernalia, and the food offered to the deity are also not separate from Krishna. One has to follow the rules and regulations prescribed by the Acharyas, and thus, under superior guidance, Krishna realization is fully possible even in this material existence. The gopis, having been instructed by Krishna in this philosophy of simultaneous oneness and difference, remained always in Krishna consciousness and thus became liberated from all material contamination. The consciousness of the living entity who falsely presents himself as the enjoyer of the material world is called Jiva Kosh, which means imprisonment by the false ego. Not only the gopis, but anyone who follows these instructions of Krishna is immediately freed from the Jiva Kosh imprisonment. A person in full Krishna consciousness is always liberated from false egoism. He utilizes everything for Krishna's service and is not at any time separated from Krishna. The gopis therefore prayed to Krishna, Dear Krishna, from your navel emanated the original lotus flower, which is the birth site of Brahma, the Creator. No one can estimate your glories or your opulence, which therefore remain always a mystery even to the highest thoughtful men, the masters of all yogic power. The conditioned soul, fallen in the dark well of this material existence, can very easily, however, take shelter of your lotus feet. Thus his deliverance is guaranteed. The gopis continued, Dear Krishna, we are always busy in our family affairs. We therefore request that you remain within our hearts as the rising sun. That will be your greatest benediction. The gopis are always liberated souls because they are fully in Krishna consciousness. They only pretended to be entangled in household affairs in Vrindavan. In spite of their long separation, the inhabitants of Vrindavan, the gopis, were not interested in the idea of going with Krishna to his capital city, Dvorka. They wanted to remain busy in Vrindavan and thus feel the presence of Krishna in every step of their lives. They immediately invited Krishna to come back to Vrindavan. This transcendental emotional existence of the gopis is the basic principle of Lord Chaitanya's teaching. The Ratha Yatra festival observed by Lord Chaitanya is the emotional process of taking Krishna back to Vrindavan. Srimati Radharani refused to go with Krishna to Dvorka to enjoy his company in the atmosphere of royal opulence, for she wanted to enjoy his company in the original Vrindavan atmosphere. Lord Krishna, being profoundly attached to the gopis, never goes away from Vrindavan, and the gopis and other residents of Vrindavan remain fully satisfied in Krishna consciousness. Thus ends the Bhakti Vedanta purport of the third volume, thirteenth chapter of Krishna. Lord Krishna and Balaram meet the inhabitants of Vrindavan.